under the guise of Saratoga 150. I thought I'd do some overdue catching up and here with a man who needs no introduction, but I'll introduce him anyway, Harvey Pack. That's true, and I'm not here, although I was there on opening day 150 <laughs> years ago. I didn't have a winner, but they had bookmakers then. It was very good. I shopped them, but I didn't have a winner. And I was sure that that was going to be the end of it. And look what happened. 150 yeah. years later. How many actual consecutive meets do you think after the 150? After you took a few years off, right? How many did you make? Well, no, it's not fair. I, for, the first time I went to Saratoga was 1951. And that was as a racing fan. And I didn't come back until I was working there in the 70s. Oh, is that right? Yeah. Oh, really? So there's over a 20 year gap. In fact, during that time, I went to Monmouth. And I thought that there was no Saratoga. <laughs> and when I got to work there, a guy said, are you looking forward to the Travers? I said, who's he? <laughs> I really had no connection with Saratoga, believe it or not. Oh, really? Yeah, but and when I got there, of course, I fell in love with it. Now, what year did you start working? 74. Okay. So two years before we met, because we met in 76, actually. I've I was never forgotten. I was I, a little, I'm a little older now than you were then when I met you. That's true, you are. But I do, I remember you, you were a little fellow, and that's why I always <laughs> called you Little Andy. And you used to follow Andy Byer around. Yeah. And you had a clipboard, which you held like this. God, this is embarrassing. And you would follow him all over, wherever he went, up, down, and around. And guys say, who's that following Andy? So it's a guy named Andy. And so, but he's little. He's little Andy. And that stuck. Yes, that, that is. For which I apologize. All, all of that is true. So this is a little like when your parents bring up baby pictures. <laughs> You're going to bring up some memories of me when I was an even more obnoxious younger kid. But uh, talk about Saratoga when you first, like some of your early memories and when you first started coming and working here. Well, the first, when I went there, the first thing that happened actually happened down, downstate. I'm getting paid every other week, whatever it was. And one day a check is there. And I open it up. And it was, I think, $600. And I called up accounting. And I said, I just got a check by mistake. I don't want to get arrested. You sent me $600. And the guy said, that's your per diem for Saratoga. They pay you to go to Saratoga? And I never got over it. For the whole 25, 30 years I was there, when that check came, I used to look at it and say, I can't believe this. However, I never won, but I like being there. But at Saratoga, when we first went, you were there then. The charm of it was the horses walking around the tree and the number placed on the tree. And if you liked a horse, you'd go over there, see the owners. It was a very intimate place. And when some years later we had to drop it because of insurance, mm -hmm. I said, well, that's the end of Saratoga. I had said the same thing about ATMs, <laughs> but I said, that's it. that will never be the same. And lo and behold, we made this wonderful park where people picnic, and it's better than it ever was, which astounded me, and I'm delighted about it. No, I agree. Sarah, was a track that is adapted a bit to the times, and I did think that would lose a lot of the charm. But the paddock is so big, people were able to get it's next great. to it. And they can picnic and, and do all those things. Then I remember the first year, you, Sunday racing wasn't there in oh, 74. Yeah. When we finally put it in, uh, maybe eight, ten years, I don't no, even remember. No, about 76, 77. Oh, really? that, it wasn't anyway, that far after that. I said, wow, are we going to be crowded on Sundays? You won't be able to get in. I told my wife, don't come near the track on Sunday. It'll be overflowing. Well, every Sunday, and we only had four in those days, every Sunday that summer, the temperature hit 90, and we were all alone. There was nobody at the track because people who were on vacation went to the lake. But fortunately, in the years that followed, things settled down, and then we started the giveaways. Now, the giveaways, which, of course, occurred Everybody would be online to get them, and then they'd leave, and then they'd come back and get them. Those were your people, the Saratogians. They'd keep turning <laughs> around, <people>. coming back, <laughs> and the bet was that before the second race, they'd be, one of them would be on eBay. Would you like a, a, a picnic basket with a Saratoga emblem? Fine. Because that person had 50 and wanted to get rid of them. But the, if, as much as we made fun of it, I think the giveaways were terrific. I think they helped. I think they increased our fan base. And I really believe it worked. Now, can you name the worst giveaway we ever had? Uh, I'm trying to think. When was the Rick, Atlas? When was Rick Marks? <laughs> the Atlas. Yes, Rick yes, Marks Atlas, right. gave away an Atlas. <laughs> Steve and Chris likes to take some credit for that, well, too, I we think. We still have 100,000 of them somewhere. <laughs> Nobody wanted an Atlas. I only wanted to know how to get the Saratoga, and I'm here. Yes, those were great days. And it was every, those four weeks and later, what have you got up to now, 12? No, you're at six and a half or seven. They're most of the year. But the four weeks, were, which were, I remember the most, were wonderful because it was a short time. And if you were there two weeks, you could say, we're going home in two. Now when you're there two, you're going home in four. I want to stay there the well, whole... You, I, I, would stay, I, would, I would be in February, I would be going in track. Of course, there. but you live there. 
you don't even count. You're a Saratoga native. I didn't think there were any. But then when I met you in 1976, I said, that's, the, that's it. That's what we have up here. Little guys with clipboards. <laughs> following around. Incidentally, just to set the record straight, Andy now follows him. Big Andy now follows him. Because he said, figures quite correctly he's a better handicapper. Uh, it probably didn't take too much to do that. Now, when, you, when I met you and I used to go in your office, yes. it was an incredible cast of characters. Yes, it was. Talk about some of those people. Well, everybody was in there. We had this guy, Jack Brown, who represented OTB and didn't know what o, where OTB was because he went to the track all the time. <laughs> His boss, a wonderful guy named Harry McCabe, wanted a bet. And when you worked at OTB, you couldn't bet. So he had Jack Brown run his bet. Every day, Jack would come in, how are you, Jack? Harry? And Harry would say, first race, and he'd give him the money. And Jack, well, he was terrific. I absolutely adored him. Then we had uh, Mark Hopkins, who was Andy Byer's partner, Andy, sure. still a friend of mine. He was, they also, of mine made, also. also lives up there. And we had Doc. Doc was in there. I have to expand a little bit on Doc without giving his last name. Doc also had a clipboard, right? <laughs> yes, he did. He went around he with a clipboard. He used more than me. He was a professional better. He was an MD, but he never practiced, and many lives have been saved <laughs> accordingly. But he used to stand by the machine that gives you exact the possibilities, and he would write them down. He hated the sheets. He hated big betters. But why was he copying it down? He wanted to know who they were betting, and he would write it all down. And then he would he bet trifectas or triples. He boxed ten horses and when the race was over. How did you do? Well, if the six and one, I would have had it. I mean, it was unbelievable. He would run around all day doing this. Now, one day, and I remember this quite clearly, in the paddock area where the betting was, somebody dropped with a heart attack, flat on the ground, and they yelled, is there a doctor in the house? And Jack Brown said to me, do you think he'll respond? I said, well, it is an instinct if you've been a doctor. And he's standing there, is there a doctor in the house? And suddenly we see him turn around, and he runs over to where the person is lying. And they say, are you a doctor? Yes, I'm a doctor. He says, this man's had a heart attack. And he looks at him, no, he hasn't. Epileptic fit, and he walked away. And he was right. Of course he was right, and the guy was okay, and had it been a heart attack, if it had been post time, he would have walked away anyway. But he was, he was, he would have been a good doctor, but not for you or me. And also, how about, how about trainers, and I mean, there wasn't, I mean, Nick Zito, I think, was a somewhat regular in the room. I think there were some trainers yeah, and Nick some other Yeah, Nick was a regular. Howie Tesher too. was a regular. Nick was always there. In fact, when I first met Nick, he had one client, Alan Rotsoff, yeah, whose family built the subway. Sure. And Nick was his uh, trainer. We got friendly then, and we've been friends ever since. I love Nick. He still talks about going in the office. Yes, he was always welcome in the office. In fact, when we, when we all got in the office at Aqueduct, at, at Saratoga, they'd walk in and look in. And somebody would say, see the animals in their natural habitat. <laughs> they were all sitting around the room shorting. It was a great time. And I never understood why I was paid to be here. It's it's a funny thing going to the racetrack. It is for those of us, for a lot of people that can't understand why we want to be at the racetrack. For us, we can understand why everybody else doesn't want want to be at the racetrack. Well, that was one of the things when I did the paddock club downstate. I used to come and I do the daily double. I would talk to them about horses and bang my. I would they would say, what about Oscar Barrera? I'd say, bet, don't look. You know things like that. I could do anything with them. But when I got up to Saratoga, I looked around and it's a completely different audience. They're younger. They're vacationers. The older people who are there have never been to a racetrack. You really had a different group. So I fashioned a different paddock club. I went out there, and at that time I actually did it in the paddock. This was before they went where you work now, before they built the sure. carousel. And I used to start with stories about racing. I would tell three or four jokes, same jokes every time. for 15, 20 years. Nobody caught on. They still laugh. Then I would tell them about betting. And this is a place when you retire and have nothing to do, we will let you make nine decisions every day and you'll know if you're right or wrong in 20 minutes. This was the whole thing, the whole approach that I did, and I hope I made a few fans. When the book came out, I actually got a few letters from people who had seen me in the Paddock Club, bought the book and said I remembered all the story because I repeated the jokes in the book. Why waste them? Well, everybody, I mean, I know you don't believe me, but people do constantly ask me. I mean, you're popular racetrack, but in Saratoga, obviously, you are an iconic figure. You will argue with that, but it actually is true. When you had the paddock club, it was actually 
right, right where the racing office is now. It was actually unenclosed. It was the, the old that, paddock, the old paddock area actually the paddock. was. But you also brought in, I think, speakers. I mean, you had handicappers come in and go the, to the car. Yeah, but they're not too. as much as I did when we moved to the carousel. Okay. When we moved to the carousel, I figured this out. Why am I here? So what I would do is I do those same three, four jokes, and I'd say, and now let's welcome Andy Beyer. And Andy would come in, and as he came in, I'd go back to my office to read. But that, they, did, they did come in and do the races, yes. In fact, Andy will tell the story with his mortal locks. I still get letters from people saying, I used to just wait to bet against his mortal lock. He's riding his bike, you may know this story, all over the outskirts of Saratoga, up because he's a health nut. He wants to outlive this end. Right, contra contrary to popular belief, yes. Andy Byers is a health nut. He is a health nut. Yeah, yes. So he rode up and down the hills, and a guy yelled at him as he's coming down there, Boy, that horse you gave out stank. <laughs> right? Well, he's saying he didn't do anything. People knew all the time because the Paddock Club was popular. No, and Andy wasn't afraid to give out his opinions. In fact, I think he had. I, I think he once gave out an exacta on the Belmont Stakes uh, car here, um, and he said he was going to make a hundred thousand dollars or something. And I think he hit it. it. Was Pine Circle when he finished second to Swale? I don't know what he won, but didn't he make some pronouncement yeah. he was going to get rich with that? He, that? That was his one. You know, everybody has one, <laughs> but there's got to be a reason he checks in with you on a daily basis. Well, there was a famous story of a horse in Saratoga, which you weren't party to, and there was a bit of a rift involving no, you and yeah, actually Pete Axtell. Pete Axtell, right? Well, because Andy Boyer, thinking about that, I wish you hadn't brought that up. Some horse had run at I Philadelphia know the Park. Name. I know the horse's Philadelphia name. Philadelphia Park, and they had been fined for not trying. And I didn't know. It, it was in the racing form. It was the old, remember the old thing in the racing form that listed the infractions, and one very astute handicapper whose name shall remain nameless uh, had seen that in the paper. Well, they told him then. No, he knew. He, he saw knew it. In the, saw it was actually listed. Anyway. Remember the old fines that were mostly, you know, smoking in the shed row or whatever it was? There was one thing for the jockey, failure to give forth the proper effort in his mount or something. Well, we don't, we never did that here to my knowledge. That, that kind of a Everybody punishment. always gave a But he effort. found it. And he scored out. And Axton, Axton went crazy. He was, I said, Take it easy. It's his life. Let him have a winner. He said, he could have told us, what are we going to bet? I said, $10, which is true. We weren't big betters, but, they, but Andy was very secretive. He does want to win, and it's all ego. We know the famous story when the rail was dead. The rail was dead at Pimlico, and he was handicapping for the Washington Post then. And he told all his readers, the rail is dead, the rail is dead. Against Seattle Slew, right? And, and, and he gets to the track, and the first race they run, the horse on the rail wires the field. The second race, they run the horse on the rail. Then in the third race, there's a horse on the rail, and he, of course, gave out as his best bet a horse on the outside, and he went and bet the horse on the rail, and when it won, he yelled out, Sorry, readers, I got out, <laughs> which I again, now, never forgot. But that, he likes to win. I have no objection to well, that. Well, I mean, that's, but, you know, it's interesting, as you bring up, of course, one of the dilemmas of being a public handicapper is you have to adapt. I mean, if you're a horse player at the racetrack, you're going to change your pick sometimes during the day. I mean, that's why we give out horses and talking horses. And, and really, you know, talking about talking horses, you were really sort of the guy who kind of invented the prattles. Yes, at least I did. Here. Yeah, that's one of the things I apologize for every day. <laughs> but in all honesty, I don't want to gild the lily or compliment you. There's never been anyone better than you doing it because you're better than any public handicapper. You take a shot. You don't, you're not afraid to say what you believe. I really think you're the best. And I've told this to a lot of people. Some of them have looked at me like I'm crazy. But then I say to them, do you get it? And he says, no, we don't get that. I said, then be quiet. I'm telling you he's very good. They said, do you follow him? I said, do you think I'm nuts? But they didn't want to know. But I do. I listen every once in a while. In the old days, before you made the good website, I used to be able to print them on my computer. But now they go past me, and I can't do it. Oh, you got to do them. You, gotta have, you have to have print. You'd have to print three copies. I can't Maybe do I can that. Maybe I give you some money for paper. The, actually, I got my start doing that with you because back at least in the 70s, here on the weekends in New York, both here at Ackworth, you would have celebrity guests between races on just weekends, and I think 70. Five or maybe seventy-six. After I first met you, it was the first time I went on. I used you, yeah. Yeah, I used to come on. I use a lot of people. Axel would be on. A lot of good people. Were on. Those days we had besides me. But the best thing when we did the show, the regular show, the uh, recap show, we used to bring in guests from the studio, from the fan base. They would write in a letter, and Mitch Levitis would pick the guy out, and he'd come in and do the show with me. And I thought it was a terrible idea. It was the only good idea Mitch ever had. And we did it, and it was quite successful. Now, we had one guy on who worked at the Reader's Digest. <laughs> and Mitch fell in love with him, Eric Wing. He said, 
this guy is the greatest. And every time I'd show up, there'd be Eric Wayne. And I said, why is he on every time? And they said, because I think he's very good. And now he works here. Think about that. Yeah. Took how long? It took him 30, 25, so, 30 So years. you're responsible for me and Eric. Eric Wayne, man. What about Mitch? Mitch came to work for us when we started the show. I wouldn't show. take credit for he that. He was only going to stay a week. A week! Because he thought the Sports Channel was going to promote him. They promoted him to stay here forever. <laughs> they sent him to jail. But he's made a career here, and I'm very proud of him. He's the thing that wouldn't leave. Yep, essentially. No, I'm essentially. very proud of him. We, had a lot, we did a lot with Saratoga. He was with us there. He used to love the per diem. You know, everything. He always shared a house with about 11 people. But we had a great time with him. And I want to give him credit for something else, which I objected to. Stan Epstein, who was the director, and Mitch, said to me up at Saratoga, why don't you interview some old timers? I said, it interferes with my tennis. Because <laughs> in those days, I was young. I played tennis every single day and then went to the races. Come on, it'll take you one morning. I said, now, instead of doing the, re the show that you do now, the, uh, where you show right. racing around the country, why don't we do that? And I objected and I fought it. And finally, I gave in. And in all honesty, they were probably the best shows yeah, the we best ever shows. did. Yeah. We had uh, Woody. We had Johnny Nearwood. We had Walter Kelly, yeah. and I told Walter Kelly, the statute of limitations are over. You can tell us whatever you want to tell us. And he did. He told us about a few putovers That's from the good old days. So even that, it was Mitch's fault. I blame him, but they were great shows. I think Reggie was on those shows. Reggie, there were a lot of great Reggie the bookmaker, shows, yeah. the English bookmaker. <laughs> this, this guy, he was at the track in the 20s and 30s, Reggie, and he told me that in those days, they didn't have vans to bring the horses up. So they'd all get off the train and be led up, or they'd all be led really? up. Yeah. And like the circus when they come Very much right. like the circus. And they would all come up and they would go in there. And he told me that, told me a lot of things. And when we had our first strike, I said to Don Drew, who was head of mutual, Reggie would like to do it to take a window. So Don Drew knew him. He said, he's good. We'll put him in the big window. So they put him in the big window. We, uh, we were short at about 3,000, but I wasn't held responsible because it wasn't a check. They didn't blame me for that one. Probably thought I was sharing it with him. He was a funny guy, though. Yeah, uh, those, those were great shows. Now, I, I look back, I remember in the early days when you, before you wanted to do the replay show, when you wanted to do it and you got started, and that's when Mitch came, you started working with Mitch, because you're actually the person who thought of the whole idea to have the replay show at night. I don't think there was any show anywhere really doing that. There was no way I was going to get that show. Jim Heffernan was the president of the track, and he loved me. And I went in and I said to him, Jim, we've got to do a nightly replay show. You know, we can do it with shtick. And I went there and said, great idea. And I think Denny might have been this. Whoever it was said, well, we have McKinsey and company doing a survey on what to do. And they threw me out. Believe it or not, McKinsey's first paragraph was, you should have a cable show. And Heffernan called me and he says, you're in. That's great. And then fortunately, John Tata, who was Vice President, uh, second in command of Cablevision with uh, Mr. Dolan was a horse player. And he's the first person I went to. He, well, that's a great idea. And that's how it started. Well, it was a legendary show. I mean, list some of the people that were on. It was a 45 minute show, I think, when yes, you first started. 40 you had, to 45. I mean, you had great guests. And not just, you know, sort of run of the mill guys, really smart guys. No, we did. We had a lot of smart guys, and they were able to talk. The bet, the, Steve Chris, when he was on, what, what I always remember about him is I would say, Steve, do a one-minute commentary on something, and he'd start talking, and he'd talk exactly 60 seconds and stop. <laughs> he was great. We had a lot of more, but of course, I created a lot of monsters on that show that may not be that great, but every, we had a lot of fun with it. I think we paid them uh, 50 bucks or $50. $50 was a big deal to a lot of them, of course, of their opinion. In those days, even before that, you know, there used to be a bookmaker in the press box. This goes back into the uh, way before I got here. And he allowed the press to bet at the quarter pole. That's the truth. He's probably rich. Well, he beat them. He beat every one of them. So that's the why. Well, you know, back in those days, you look back in those days, you could bet. I mean, you could bet on inquiries. You could bet on photos. I mean, I remember more at Gulfstream when I used to go there in the winter. Even in the 90s, you could get action on things around then. And it was different. The photos took a while. Oh, it was great, the yeah. photos. Remember Photo Bar? Remember Photo no, Bar? No. <laughs> Mitch remembers them. He was a friend of Jack Brown. <laughs> Photo Bob would stand at the finish line. And when there was a very close race, he'd just throw up the number of who won it. And a friend of his in the stands would start betting people on the photo. Because they knew who won. He was right on the line. Photo Bob. 
Photo Barb, not only that, Photo Barb broke a, a buffet up at Saratoga. Remember the place that used to have a buffet, a breakfast buffet? Sure, Mother Goldsmith. Mother Goldsmith. Yeah. Photo Barb went in there and went back so many times for coffee cake <laughs> that the next day it said no more. Uh, he, he broke the buffet. I never had him on the show. Now, in those days, you also, when you did the show, is it true you had color-coordinated jackets for each different yes, that was including my light blue for no, the no, winter, for the winter? No, that was my idea, <laughs> because I don't have, as you can see, I'm not clothes conscious. <laughs> and they said to me, you've got to wear a jacket. You're on the show every day. So I went home and I said, aqueduct is light blue. Belmont is green. Think of it, I'm right. Yeah. Saratoga red. is red. So I got hold, I think it was Palm Beach was the name of the clothier. And I called up and I said, you have a red? And they did, they had all three. And I went in and I got an expenses to have them. And I never had to think what to wear again. To this day, I still have an old blue one somewhere. <laughs> sure, we should have brought you in the Belmont Green. Now, you also interviewed, and there were personalities besides track personalities, people like Cab Calloway. Uh, uh, he was here and he was somebody talking to Jack Klugman, a number of different people that Mickey came Rooney. to the races. Mickey yes. Rooney. Mickey Rooney was the best. Mickey Rooney was, and still is, thank God, nuts. Mickey Rooney invented something for betting horses. And I said, what is it, Mick? And he said, this dice. <laughs> you roll the dice, and it told you whether to bet win, place, or show, and how much. I used that. And I put them on. I said, tell the world about it. He told the bad news that a lot of people took it seriously. But he loved the game. And when he was on Broadway, he was here every day. And oh. Cab, whenever we needed someone to give out the trophy, we need a celebrity to give out the trophy. Cab Calloway, Heidi, Heidi Ho. So Cab would go down and do it. When Cab died, we stopped doing it. We now allow people like you and me to give out the trophy. They don't Nobody let me give out the trophy. No, no, I have not done the trophy. Five years, I'm still waiting. My wife once did trophy it. Was, my wife did it once because it was pouring rain and nobody else was <laughs> set to go out. But Cab Calloway, bless his heart, he was always there for us. I remember Mickey Rivers. That's when I was a kid in the late 70s coming out. Mickey would be on the injured list. The Yankees would have an afternoon game, and I'd see him here in the third floor at Belmont, right over here. He used to bet right in the dugout. Out of the dugout, he called his OTB account. He was a great uh, degenerate yeah. horse player. They trained him in Texas. There was no gambling down there. I think that was the reason. <laughs> no, we had a lot of people like that that used to, you know, they liked to bet. Celebrities, are, Klugman is a bad story because Klugman, <laughs> when Axelm and I were doing the uh, Breeders' Cup in California, we, Klugman came down and did some shtick with us, and he wanted to go up, and they yelled, Hold, Klugman, we want it. So we, he stayed, and he missed the race, and he said, You two guys are the worst people I've ever met. And he left, and it was our fault. And, I, you know, Pete and I agreed with him. <laughs> Pete, talk, let's talk about Pete a little bit. Well, it's, uh, Pete was a legend, and uh, kind of like a kid brother to me. I, he was 15, 16 years younger, and uh, we really loved him. But he did have a problem, let's face it. He had a lot of problems, but he didn't have a problem writing. He was a great writer. He was a terrific great writer, too. and he was a lot of fun. The worst thing that ever happened to him was getting television. You know, when they hired yeah. him to be on ESPN and then later NBC. on NBC. He was handicapping football games. When I was on NBC doing the uh, Breeders' Cup with him. How many years did you guys do it together? Five. No, he didn't, he didn't last five. I, we, I did it for five. He was fired after two. There's a great thing with the two of you taking the subway out to yes, Aqueduct. It's a great the second Breeders' Cup. Probably still on YouTube well, we, somewhere. We, uh, we were allowed to uh, choreograph our thing, so we choreographed the one. We were walking down 41st Street, or the subway, to get on the subway to Aqueduct. And we're walking down, and then when we go to do the intro, Pete says, uh, while we're walking down the street, he says, a couple of hookers came up to us. <laughs> and I said to them, not now, we're on our way to the racetrack. <laughs> and NBC got complaints from fe feminists. Well, they did. They didn't. They didn't like Pete anyway. Got over that. Then when we did the first Breeders' Cup at Aqueduct, it was freezing cold. And I'm not a big drinker, but I had a Bloody Mary almost after every... I was shaking. It was so cold. And uh, Mr. Rooney, who was head of sports, did not like Pete, adored me. So he came up to me later and he said, how many drinks did Axthelm have during the day? I said, I don't know. I lost count because I was drinking more than he was. But they didn't <laughs> like him. They let him go. Really? Then he got ESPN. The best thing would be if he didn't get anything and went back to just writing. But it wouldn't have mattered. He just had bad habits. But boy, did I, I miss him to this day. Yeah, no, he was, he was, he was really a terrific guy. He's one, one of the first people I think I met through you. And I knew Pete. I remember running into Pete. Uh, I think it's the only time that my mother ever made a bet. I had run into Pete at the Preakness um, when Ali Sheba won the Preakness. And I ran into him at Pimlico and he said to me, are you going to Belmont tomorrow? And I said, yeah. 
and he said, uh, do you have a form for tomorrow? I said, sure. And he looks through and he, give me a horse. I remember the horse's name. It was Bubba Dulia. And he said, you see this? He said, this horse, this horse is really trained by, I think maybe was it Ben Perkins or it was, some, it, was, it was some sharp trainer. And he said, won't lose. So I, my mother had loved, she'd read the city game and she loved Axe Dome. And I told the story to my father the next day and my mother said, oh, you know, Bet, bet two dollars on the horse for me, and he won ahead, Bob, and paid eight sixty. It was a, she, it was a she. She actually turned out to be a pretty good horse. But that's that's Bob a good Julia. story. Yeah. You, you know the other story, the Paul Corman story. Uh, <laughs> Paul Corman, as everybody may was a regular on the show, a very good handicapper, friend of ours, used to hang out in the office, and uh, Paul Corman had an opinion at Monmouth, and Pete and I take the boat to Monmouth. There used to be a boat that sure. took you to Monmouth. It's a boat I talk about often. Once they hit a rowboat and it capsized, and three people were thrown in the water, and they were throwing them life raft. People were going, "Leave them there! We'll miss the double," <laughs> which is something. And the only reason people did it, they all went over to one side of the boat. Anyway, we're at Monmouth, and there's a race coming. And Pete says, "I think Axelm told me that this five horse, very good, warm yeah." Axelm said to okay. me, "So he gets on the line. He says, what should we bet?'" And I said, "Consider the source." And he got off the line. We didn't bet it. Pay twenty three dollars. And from that time on, Cornman was known as the source. But that was the only time we could have considered it forever. But that day we were wrong. But they were great days. It's one of the reasons that racing was so much fun. It's one of the reasons that he's happy to be here every day, and so was I. I used to get up every day. I couldn't believe it that I was going to the racetrack because I would have been doing it anyway. They didn't want to give me a raise. And Jerry McEwen, who was the president, says. We're not going to give you a raise, because if we fired you today, you'd be paying tomorrow. And you know something? He was probably right. Yeah. The, the racetrack is a place that it may not be for everybody, but for those of us that is a place we like, we love it. Yep. And Saratoga, 150 years. I wish I had seen more of them. I missed the first few. But it was just the greatest place in the world. First of all, going out every night. You had some bad habits up there, but you're a local. We forgive you. How many meals do you think you paid for, on average? What percentage of your meals do you oh, actually pay for? Pay. Right. pay for meals? <laughs> Let me say, wait a minute, that's not true. I once got a pizza. <laughs> I, I, like, I like a pizza place up there. I used to go every once in a while. for me. Right, have you ever paid for a drink at Saratoga since you became... Uh, I'm not going to... I don't really want to I'm just it. not going there. I, I got a feeling... I paid for a few. I doubt that. And you're making fun of me? Oh, mine was just food. I'm not making fun you're of you. I'm impressed. You're running a bar I'm, Not me. I, I go home early every night. Yeah. I well, go home and work. That's work true. Very he, hard. he does the work. I go and work early. I mean, I know I'm done. Okay, working. Okay, in the I ten out. years that we were together at Ciro's, I saw you in the morning. I wasn't working here. I wasn't as responsible oh. as I am now. Those were my, my irresponsible years when I was working okay. with you. All right. The Ciro's seminars, we should talk about them. For me, they were a magical time, and I remember walking in there and even walking out knowing that just working with you and being with you was a really very special time. It was. Me. Those seminars they were, were great. highlights. Uh, oddly enough, when people say to me, what were the best years at the track, I said, believe it or not, after the track, when I did the seminars for the Racing Forum, we had great fun, and the people used to love it. They laugh at everything we said, the jokes, were, and they understood everything. There was nothing that would go past them. And the best was when my, my little grandson at that time was five. He was the youngest, my youngest grandchild. A man went up to him and said, is your grandfather this funny at home? And the kid looked at him and said, only when you pay him. <laughs> and uh, it's lived with him forever. I, he was right. He was right. It's true. I, I'm not funny when I'm not on camera. Well, we're going to wrap it up. Got well, any last thoughts you want to leave us with? Well, my last thought is I'd love to be up there this summer. That's what uh, we'd love to have. And I'm happy to say Naira invited me to come up. And I would have come, but the, at my age, it's a little hard to make long trips. And my wife, too, with the two of us, it's tough. But I'm betting every day. I'm following little Andy. And if you need it, I have a number of a good loan shark. <laughs> thank you. And thank you.